When the rapture occurs, the world will capture the moment. Cell phones, security cameras, law enforcement body cams, doorbell cams, and more will all bear video record of the great disappearance. The world will reel with concern from watching the strange, mind-boggling and unbelievable video footage that goes viral across the globe. People vanish before their eyes and all caught on camera. This event won't be science fiction, conspiracy theory, or mindless speculation. When Christ comes for his people, it will be in the twinkling of an eye. Between the resurrected dead and the raptured, billions of people will exit this planet in an instant, but billions will be left behind. It will be chaos on our globe, but incredible glorious joy in the skies. This is the rapture, the great disappearance. It is vital to know what the Bible says about this coming day. The next event on God's prophetic agenda for the earth. Are you ready? In this video, we're going to take a look and explain in detail this thing called the rapture of the church. Like some things in the Bible, there seems to be some confusion and misunderstanding, so we're going to dig in and explain this event that is described as the blessed hope. What is it? What's the purpose of it? What's it mean? And when will it happen? We will look in detail in this, so let's dig in. Hey, it's Greg Rooney here from Connect the Dots. See the big picture where we help you make sense of everything going on more clearly through a better understanding of the Bible by connecting the dots from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And if you're new to this channel, make sure you click that subscribe button below and everything mentioned in this video will be linked down there as well. And while you're there, please go ahead and comment and ask your questions. This question has been asked. Some say the church will be removed from the earth before the second coming of Jesus in a moment called the rapture. But I'm not sure that word is even in the Bible or if it's explained or talked about in the Bible. Can you help me with this? Can you explain it to me? We speak of Christ's return as a second coming because it will be the second time Christ resides on the earth. He came the first time to be the Messiah and to come as our Savior for the whole world, and he'll come the second time to rule the earth during what's called the thousand-year millennial kingdom. Now, on the other hand, the Bible does teach of another kind of appearance of Jesus, which is fundamentally different than either his first or his second coming we just discussed. This other appearance is kind of a return, but only in the clouds, i.e. in the sky, to retrieve the church saints and remove them from the earth. Now, Jesus revealed this unique return in John's gospel, chapter 14, the first three verses there. Listen to what Jesus said. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now it's interesting, at the end of John chapter 13, Jesus had announced he would leave the disciples soon. And one of his disciples, Peter, objected by saying this in verse 36 of chapter 13. Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards or later. Jesus told Peter that the disciples would have an opportunity to follow Jesus later. Then in John 14, Jesus explains what he meant. Jesus described the place he was going as the Father's house. This is the heavenly throne room, and this is the place Jesus went when he departed from the earth at his resurrection. Then Jesus said that his return to fulfill this promise will occur in the same manner as when he left the earth, as described in Acts 1, verse 9, where he says that he was passing through the clouds. Notice this particular return is strictly for the purpose of retrieving the believers on earth and then taking them back to heaven. Specifically, Jesus says he will receive us to where he is so that where he is, i.e. in heaven, so we will be also. 
Think about that for a moment. <laughs> Such an appearance of Christ is very different than the nature of Jesus' promised second coming to live and reign on the earth. In fact, this appearance is not a coming at all in the sense that Jesus never really reaches the earth or sets his feet upon the ground, according to Paul. Instead, Jesus comes to the sky to retrieve the church and then returns to the Father without making the earth his dwelling place. Let's look how Paul described this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an angel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will remain and shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now in this passage, Paul writes to comfort the church concerning the fate of those believers who die before Christ returns for his church. Paul assures the church that those who die, i.e. those that are asleep, or those that have already died at the point of the rapture will not be left behind at the rapture. But in fact, they will rise first to meet Christ. After the dead rise, those saints, those believers, those Christ followers, who are still alive on the earth at the time of the rapture will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Once again, notice that this rendezvous occurs above the surface of the earth in the sky. This is key to understanding the rapture and its timing. Therefore, we know Jesus remains in the air and only meets the raptured or resurrected saints after they have departed the earth in new resurrected bodies. Now this important detail proves this moment is a unique event and one that matches Jesus' promise to believers in John 14 that we just read a moment ago. Now the reason that it's called the rapture is because the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible published in the early 5th century used the word rapture. In 1 Thessalonians 4.17, for the Greek word that is in the original text, remember the Old Testament is written in Greek, and the word that it used there in 1 Thessalonians was harpazo, and that was translated in the Latin translation in the 5th century to raptur, or raptus, which means caught up or snatched away. And the Bible uses the word resurrection to describe this same moment or this same event in 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll look at that in a moment. Now, regarding the timing of this event in relationship to the tribulation, we first must understand the purpose of tribulation before we can establish the timing of the rapture. Now, the Bible teaches repeatedly and clearly that the time of the tribulation is a time of judgment. The Bible teaches extensively concerning this period of judgment in the books of Revelation, in Luke and Isaiah, and interestingly in books like the book of Ruth. And the Bible teaches consistently that this seven-year period of tribulation is intended by God to chasten Israel for her sins or to discipline Israel for her sins of disobedience, but it will lead to the nation as a whole to repent and turn to Christ. For example, in Ezekiel 20, Verses 33 through 38, God promises to bring Israel back into her land for a period of judgment and redemption. In Daniel 9:24, God lists seven reasons why Israel must experience the seven years of tribulation. And in Jeremiah chapter 30, God promises an unprecedented period of distress coming for Israel called the time of Jacob's trouble but the nation will be saved in the end. Look for other videos on my channel that will discuss these in more detail. So this seven year period of worldwide distress called the tribulation is a time of judgment. Due to the unprecedented nature of this time of judgment, it will impact the entire world and bring distress to everyone living on the earth in those days. Paul teaches that the church will not be subjected to this time of distress when it arrives on earth. We can find Paul teaching on the rapture and its relationship to tribulation in several passages, beginning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. You'll see in verse 10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. 
Paul says the Lord's return from heaven is time to rescue the church before the wrath to come. The wrath Paul mentions is the wrath of the entire seven years of tribulation. Now, as mentioned above, tribulation is a time of judgment intended for the Jewish nation and the unbelieving world, but the church will escape this time because Christ collects the church from the earth and escorts his bride away before the coming judgment. Now, finally, as previously mentioned, Paul gives additional details on the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15 in these four verses. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Now Paul's main point here in 1 Corinthians 15 is to demonstrate the truth of the rapture and the need for a new incorruptible body before a person can enter into the heavenly realm. Paul is teaching that at the moment of the rapture for all saints, any believers who are still alive at that moment will instantly exchange their present body for a new body. The exchange for a new incorruptible form is necessary. Why? <laughs> the exchange for a new incorruptible form is necessary because we are immediately escorted into heaven to be with the Lord. And of course, we can't be in a heavenly realm with an earthly body. This is the same rapture Paul described in 1 Thessalonians, and it is a moment the church has expected and longed for since Paul wrote these words. The rapture of the church occurs prior to the tribulation and is intended to remove the saints, the true Christ followers, prior to the Lord returning his full attention to the sins of Israel and her disobedience under the old covenant, and ultimately return to the earth at the end of this tribulation period with the church to set up his millennial kingdom. It's a 1,000 year millennial kingdom on earth where both the church and Israel will have the opportunity to rule and reign with Jesus as he's sitting on his throne in the new temple. That's described in Ezekiel 40 through 43. One of the reasons why Titus wrote in the book of Titus describing this event that we are to be looking for the Lord's soon return, and it's described as the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. One day he's gonna remove his church from this earth and then turn and pour out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world and pay full attention to his nation of Israel. And they, during this period of trials and tribulation, many will turn to Jesus and realize when he rode in on a donkey 2,000 years ago, he was their Messiah as well. What a glorious time that will be when we're all gathered together at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. But folks, are you looking forward to this event? Make sure you're part of God's church. Make sure you're a Christ follower and make sure that you have invited Jesus into your life and you'll miss the tribulation period and have an opportunity to immediately be removed from this earth, get our new heavenly body, and be forever in the Lord's presence. I want to close with a word that's actually in Arabic, and it's in one place in the Bible. It's called Maranatha. It means, come Lord, come Lord quickly. Maranatha. God bless. Yeah.